Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I'm going to talk about multi uh, multiple myeloma in the context of minimal residual disease. And the topic is MRD in myeloma. The future is here. How do I move forward? It doesn't work. It does not move. And now we go. Okay, so the outline of my talk is MRD and outcomes, and then I'm going to talk about MRD by flow cytometry, and then after that I'm going to do MRD by molecular assays. So as a brief background, there is a very strong body of literature showing that deeper responses translate into progression-free survival. That's true both for patients treated with high-dose therapy as well as patients treated without high-dose therapy. The Spanish study uh, shown on this slide shows also that uh, deeper responses translates into overall survival. More interestingly, they have looked uh, within the compartment of patients reaching a complete response, and they have used flow to show that those who are MRD negative by flow in the bone marrow and also with a low risk profile by fish have a better outcome compared to those patients who still have residual detectable disease by flow in the marrow. They have also presented very recently at the ASCO meeting that if you use uh, allele-specific oligonucleotide, uh, ASO, PCR, you can show that that also translates into progression-free survival. So deeper responses uh, to therapy translates into better outcome. So now I'm going to focus on flow cytometry for a little bit. What do we know about flow? How do we use flow in this country in order to evaluate myeloma? We actually just carried out a survey across the U.S., including 30 centers, and it just got published in the Blood Journal. So we asked uh, the directors of flow cytometry labs at 30 major medical institutions with an active myeloma program in the U.S., and 26 institutions responded to this survey. We ask the following question, how many samples do you evaluate uh, every year for myeloma? And 19 institutions said we do more than 100, and two said 51 to 105, they did not give a number. We further asked, do you do MRD for multiple myeloma? And out of these institutions, there were 11 who answered yes. So this is in 2013 in the US. We asked these institutions, what aspirate, when you do bone marrow aspirates, do you use for, for MRD? And as you can see on the left, the first, the second, the third, and I don't know, it distributes pretty evenly for those 11 labs that said that they do MRD. They are highlighted in red on the right. And I think this is very important because, as you know, the further you go, the later aspirates you use, the more blood you will have. And if you're looking for residual cells, you're not going to find any cells if you use the third aspirate. You really need to do the first one. And there are very few labs that do that. We also asked the labs, how many colors do you have in your flow machine when you look for MRD? Uh, and there were zero institutions that said we use four color. And four color is really old technology, as you're well aware. Five color technology, I think, is borderline old technology. There were two institutions that answered yes to this. And six to nine colors, which is really the up-to-date technology, was yes by nine institutions. Now, how do you use these uh, colors when you want to define what's abnormal? Obviously, that's very important. How do you define normal from abnormal? So one institution said, we use the site scatter and 45, and myeloma cells should be 45 negative, as you know. There were two institutions that said, we do that plus 38. And two institutions said 38 and 138. And as you can see on the bottom, site scatter, 38, 138, and 45 were, was answered by six institutions. So this has been very, very carefully evaluated, and it was published in 2008 by the European Myeloma Network, and they sent samples to multiple laboratories, and they asked labs if they found abnormal and normal, and then they compared for concordance or discordance. And they have published that it's only 67% concordance if you use these two technologies highlighted, uh, the second uh, last and the third last from the bottom. And it's 92% concordance if you use all the four. And using site scatter and 45 is considered to be non-standard. We asked, what colors do you actually use? When we asked the number of colors, I showed you on the previous slide, then we asked which of those colors that you use. And here you see the different antigens, and you see how many labs that answered yes to each of them. 
What do the recommendations by the European Myeloma Network tell us? They tell us that 38, 138, 45, 19, and 56, they have to be in the mix. And as you can see, 11, 11, 11, 11, and 10 labs answer yes to that. I highlight it in red here. In green, on, uh, on the lower part of this slide, 20, 27, 28, 81, and 117. These are the recommended antibodies. And now if you look on top, what came out of this survey, you see that only as low as three labs answered yes to that. So clearly there was a lot of work to be done across the country in terms of standardizing the use for antibodies. Otherwise, we will not be able to detect normal from abnormal. And to just give you an example, there are recent studies showing that uh, up to 30% of normal plasma cells can be CD19 and CD45 negative, and 15% of normal plasma cells can be CD56 positive. And I could give you many more examples. I think out of myeloma samples, only 80% are positive for CD56. So just using one or two or a few of these antibodies will not help us. You need to have the whole series. Otherwise, you will miss. You will have false positive. You will have false negative. And it's going to be meaningless. Also, we asked about how the samples were processed. And uh, after we do marrows in our clinics, we send them to the lab, and we assume that they all do the same when they take care of it. They don't, of course. So there are pre-lice, and you have post-lice staining. And as you can see here, four of them said pre, and seven says post. And there are other ways of doing it also. But what this is supposed to illustrate is the fact that they do it very differently. And what happens is that the number of cells that you will have to look when you actually do the analysis, it's going to vary a lot. If you do it, the post lysis, you're going to have a much higher yield. So the way the sample is processed in the lab is, is extremely important. And of course, questions like these, how many events do you actually acquire in order to, uh, to determine if there is MOD? How many cells do you need to count? There is no book for that. We have not yet decided how many cells you need to count in order to to say that you do a good job. It's really up to each lab or each, each person think that there is a, a way to do it. And what's the cutoff for positive negative? There is no book for that either. So to summarize what came out of this survey, uh, you can see here that the lab that counted most events counted between three and four million cells each and every time in the bone marrow. And if they found 20 or more to be abnormal, that would be equal to positive. The lab that gave the lowest number, they said, we count only 100,000 cells. And if we find 20 or more, we call that abnormal. So if you multiply those two variables, then you come up with the maximum possible uh, sensitivity. And as you can see on, this, on the second rightest column, there's about a 100-fold difference. So it's basically like saying, here's a patient. Your sodium varies between 10 and 1,000. But I don't really sh I'm not really sure. That's about what this is. So to give you an example of how this comes into play in a clinical context, here's a 53-year-old lady with myeloma. At diagnosis, her abnormal plasma cells, they were CD19 negative. They were 45 negative. They were dim for 38. They were CD20 negative, 56 positive, 81 negative, and CD27 dim. Now we treated her, and we are asking, is she MOD positive or negative? We do an aspirate. We run 3 million cells. And on the right, you see in purple that there are normal plasma cells, and in red, there are abnormal plasma cells. So what you're seeing here is that these cells were gated for 38, 138. And then out of that sub-gated population, we're looking at CD56 expression. So there are 30 cells that are found to be abnormal. So with the cutoff of 20, this patient would now be deemed to be positive. So what we did was that we took the computer and said, just show us the first 1 million. Now only 12 cells are positive. And show us 500,000 cells. Six are abnormal. Show us 100. There are no abnormal. So if you want to have MOD negativity every time you treat, you should only look for 100,000 cells. Every patient is going to be negative. So the summary here is that MOD testing by flow varies greatly in the United States in the year of 2013. There is no standard, there is no book, and it ranges from 0 0.0005 to 0.2% for a maximum detection rate. 
Out of these uh, 30 labs that were asked, 26 answered, and 11 said yes. Five out of these, they are using gating strategies that have been defined uh, uh, by the European Myeloma Network. One of them does not use what's deemed to be essential. I hope I've convinced you that there is very, very urgent need for consensus guidelines. And there is a process initiated uh, uh, at the NCI. We have uh, set up a uh, workshop with the FDA, and we would like to roll that out across the country because we need it right away. I also want to talk a little bit about molecular assays. I think flow has to come out first. But after we have done that, then we should start thinking about molecular. And I want to just give a few perspectives on that. So there have been a lot of work done uh, for several years. There is not a whole lot of literature. These are the three major pieces out there. You have the ASO PCR for VDJ rearrangement. You have high throughput VDJ sequencing. And also, uh, there is nothing for myeloma as of right now, but for other cancers using the targeted or whole exon sequencing. So just to give a little brief update on this. The ASO P PCR uh, allows you to detect clonal plasma cells for VDJ rearrangement. So either you could sequence a patient and see what VDJ sequences this given patient has, and then use PCR primers and follow that same patient over and over and over again. That would be to customize your samples. It's a lot of work, and each patient needs to be worked up very thoroughly. You can also use the so-called Biomed 2 consensus primers that have been published. If you do that, that's a combination of primers that have been found to be true in about 70 to 80 percent of patients. So you will inherently miss 20 to 30 percent of the patients. And also, if patients have multiple clones, which I believe most of them have, you will miss a lot of information. This has been found to be correlated with flow, and also I showed you in the very beginning that it translates into progression-free survival. The other approach is to use the high throughput VDJ sequencing. There is a company called Sequenta in California that provides this as a service. They extract DNA, uh, they add a known reference IGH, they amplify this, and then they sequence it, and then they allow, that allows them to quantify. So they have the sequencing as the baseline, but a limitation, in my opinion, with this technology is that you still pick your winner. So you sequence the patient, you find the dominant clone, and then you treat the patient and you follow over time. And you're going to keep on looking for that dominant clone you had in the beginning. But if that dominant clone is gone, you're going to say, great, we did a good job. But what about other clones that you didn't pick as the winner? If they come up, you will not find them. So the first technology has the consensus primers, where you inherently are kind of Pre you, you preclude yourself from finding anything outside those primers. With this technology, you have a lot of information, but you pick a winner, and if you pick the wrong winner, again, you're doomed. So these are data from the Spanish group from ASCO. Uh, they presented uh, marrow that was assessed by both flow and this VDJ sequencing technology, and they found uh, in 82% of the patients, they were able to do that, and they were all in VGP or in CR. They, strong, they found a strong correlation between the sequencing platform and, and flow, similar to what I showed you for the ASO PCR. Interestingly, based on small numbers, this MRD negativity, when this test was MRD negative, it was associated with better overall survival. I think this is very interesting, and I think it needs to be looked upon in larger series. This could have huge implications for drug development. If we could find uh, strong data that these types of assays uh, actually translate into overall survival, that would speed up drug development drastically. Uh, we have also done work at the NCI using this same platform, and we have treated patients with cofilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And out of uh, 14 patients, we were able to uh, do this test on the first 13. Uh, what we found is that one patient that was negative by flow uh, was positive in the blood with this technology. And what we did a little bit differently from the Spanish study uh, is that the Spanish study, they looked for tumor cells from the aspirate in the bone marrow. They, they took out the DNA from those tumor cells and did this assay. What we did was that we looked for free circulating DNA in the bloodstream and then used this assay for, as a cell-free, free circulating DNA approach. So one patient was positive uh, taking this uh, free, uh, cell-free assay in the blood, comparing it to the flow in the marrow. But at the same time, 
I would like to highlight the fact that one patient was positive in the bone marrow by flow, while the technology in the blood was negative. So it goes in both directions. The last method along the lines of molecular assays uh, I want to highlight is uh, whole exome sequencing or targeted sequencing. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, there are nice studies uh, along the lines of clonal evolution. And this is from Jonathan Keats and uh, et al. that was published in Blood last year, showing that the patient with myeloma with whole uh, exome sequencing has a lot of different clones to begin with. And as you treat the patient, when he or she uh, relapses, the distribution of these clones varies. And eventually, what unfortunately happened in this patient was that the clone that was the smallest one in the very beginning turned out to be the one that killed the patient and also developed plasma cell leukemia. So the reason why I show you this is because if you pick early on the dominant clone, and that's not the clone that's going to be the bad one in the end, you're never going to be able to do anything good out of that. You need to think in a, in a broader context. So one approach could maybe be to do whole genome or targeted uh, exome sequencing. So you could quantify identified mutations using peripheral blood, uh, using, for example, targeted sequencing. This has not been done in myeloma. It has been done in breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So in plain language, what this is, is that you sequence the whole thing. The first two technologies I've showed you are focusing on VDJ. This includes everything. And as you can imagine, it's much more complicated. Uh, we just sent five samples off from our research lab to do this, and I think uh, the bill that came back was like $50,000. And you get the hard drive of data for each patient, and there is no book how to analyze it. So it's a little bit complicated. It's expensive and complicated. So I think a lot of work needs to be done to really streamline these data, and to know where to look, and, and to, we have to bring down the cost. So we are not yet there with these technologies, but I think if we only pick these targeted technologies, they may not give us the full answer in the, in the, in the, as the next step. And that's one of the reasons I think that flow needs to come first, and then we need to figure out the details on the molecular side. So summary and conclusion, I've listed these technologies here, the ASO-PCR, the VDJ sequencing, the whole exome sequencing, and on the right I put the flow. So universal assays, there is no uh, universal assay for ASO-PCR. There is for the VDJ sequencing. Uh, for whole exome sequencing, I put both yes and no, because you have the technology, but how to analyze it and all that is not entirely clear. And for flow, the answer is yes. Sensitivity, uh, based on what these different technologies claim, as you can see, it goes from 10 up, raised up to minus 5, minus 5, unknown for whole exome, and minus 4, maybe minus 5 for flow, depending on how many events you, you, you look for. Uh, sample analyzed, you can do bone or aspirates, or you can do plasma, and it depends on which technology you use. Uh, the variation across people who, who do the test, the inter-observer variation is there for PCR, is unknown for sequencing uh, for both uh, VDJ and whole exome. And I think that's one of the major drawbacks for the flow, that there's a significant variation. Uh, can you study clonal evolution? You cannot do that with the PCR because you have your consensus primers. You're stuck with what you picked. Uh, there's limited detection for VDJ because you pick your favorite one, and then you're stuck with that. For whole exome, yes, there is. But then you have to do so much work every time. So therefore, I put yes and no. And for flow, you don't have that. Uh, can you overcome sampling error? What I mean there is that uh, you can look in blood. Uh, you can look in bone marrow. Uh, I think that's a major problem. Uh, I'm going to show that on the next slide in full detail what I mean. I think it's likely with the ASO-PCR, you maybe can do it with the VGJ, you maybe can do it for whole exome, and you maybe can do it with flow. And what I mean with this sampling arrow is the following. But myeloma is a patchy disease of the marrow. You can also have extramedullary disease. There is heterogeneity to begin with. You have multiple clones. As you treat them, they go up and down. And maybe it's beyond plasma cells. And I'm sure you saw just a couple of weeks ago a very beautiful paper by Roger Tiedemans up in Canada in Cancer Cell, where they also show that you have the plasma blast uh, having the same uh, signature as the abnormal plasma cells. So if you eradicate all the plasma cells, all these tests I've showed you today may be negative, but there may be other cells that are bad that could still go into what we call clinical multiple myeloma. 
So just to keep an eye open for that, that we can do a good job, we can find residual disease, and, and, and we can improve on that, but there could be other things. But nevertheless, I think, coming back to my first slide, the Spanish group has showed that the deeper you treat, uh, the better outcome you have. So I think even if there is residual disease, I still think it makes sense to think about this from a clinical point of view. The last point I want to make is that beyond all these blood tests and bone marrow tests and all these types of tests, there could be completely different ways of thinking about it. And this is a study published in blood by uh, Michel Cavas' group from Italy, uh, where they did uh, PET-CT uh, for baseline, and they treated patients with high-dose therapy, and then they did the PET-CT again. And they showed that those patients who did not have any residual uh, SUV uptake, they had a better overall survival. PET-CT is not the answer to myeloma. It has a lot of drawbacks, but I just want to highlight the fact that there could be things outside blood tests and molecular and cell, uh, flow and all that type of stuff. So the title of my talk was MRD in myeloma, the future, my thinking, technology is here. I think that's true. But what we need as a next step is to develop consensus guidelines on how to use them. Thank you very much.